Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Literary Studies. I am John Yargo, your host. I'm excited to welcome Elliot Borenstein to the podcast today to discuss his new monograph, Marvel Comics in the 1970s, The World Inside Your Head, published through Cornell University Press in 2023. Elliot is professor of Russian and Slavic studies at New York University. He has published a number of books, Soviet Self-Hatred, The Secret Identities of Post-Socialism, Plots Against Russia, Conspiracy and Fantasy After Socialism, Men Without Women, Masculinity and Revolution in Russian Fiction from 1917 to 1929, and Overkill, Sex, Violence, and Russian Popular Culture After 1991, all from Cornell University Press. Marvel Comics in the 1970s focuses on five writers, all born between 1945 and 1948, and their iconic takes on characters and titles. Steve Englehart's Shang-Chi and Dr. Strange, Doug Munch's Master of Kung Fu, Marv Wolfman's Tomb of Dracula, Don McGregor's Black Panther and Luke Cage, and Steve Gerber's Howard the Duck. In particular, the book explores how subjectivity and the self are expressed through the unique medium and genre constraints of 1970s era Marvel comics. Welcome to the podcast, Elliot. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I want to start by asking you what you think of the particular cultural moment we're in. I think both of us grew up as a serious comic book readers uh, of a mainstream superhero comics at a time when that was uh, not considered um, a kind of mature reading, uh, considered maybe an adolescent interest. Now the media landscape is saturated, maybe too saturated with Marvel IP, Marvel content. Um, how, how might your book, Marvel Comics in the 1970s, help us to understand the media landscape of 2023? That's an interesting question because I think one of the things that my book would probably help lead you to is how incredibly unlikely the scenario that we're living in is now, that we are in a Marvel saturated culture. Um, In the 1970s, well, every decade they're predicting the death of comics, but in the 1970s, Marvel was not in great shape. The comic industry wasn't in great shape. Um, No one really respected this stuff and the only Um, serious attention for the most part that was coming to comics was to art comics Um, so the idea that these characters could be done in such a way that adults would want to watch them without it necessarily being campy um, that was pretty much inconceivable and some of it of course has to do with special effects but I think also uh, the the genre matured a great deal it took a lot of inspiration from the 1970s, then, but then took on um, several sheens of professionalization that the 1970s didn't have. Um, and so um, you have the men in suits, basically, combined with um, the gun, with uh, the influence of the Gonzo writers, um, eventually coming up with something that um, fits this really fascinating niche of the of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The 1970s are often overlooked in terms of comics history. Uh, the 1960s had the Lee Kirby run on Fantastic Four, the Lee Ditko, and then Lee Ramita Sr. Spider-Man, as well as um, Underground Comics. Um, the 1980s uh, are associated strongly with, with the, like the Claremont X-Men, uh, Frank Miller's Daredevil and Batman series, um, some of Alan Moore's most celebrated work like Watchmen, uh, Miracle Man. Um, What attracted you to the 1970s, which is kind of overlooked, kind of glossed over in a a lot of um, histories of comic books? And what what is the main argument of Marvel in the 1970s? Well, a couple of things attracted me to the 70s. One is, frankly, it's my decade. That is the decade when I got interested in comics and the decade when I not only was reading comics, but also developed the ability to differentiate among them and, and figure out which ones I found were not just good, but really interesting and innovative, which ones were just okay. Um, But the other part is that since since I grew up really loving certain comics, like the one, most of the ones that I talk about in this book, I took for granted that these were significant and influential. I assumed everybody would, um, but as I read more and more comic scholarship, I just didn't see that many references um, to this period and to the the better Marvel comics to come out of it um, as 
at the very least steps on the way to what you saw in the 1980s, independent publishing, the graphic novel boom, um, to much more experimental uh, comics uh, creation. And so I felt like this was a really um, interesting missing period. And also I'm fascinated by how hard it is to teach this stuff because I teach a graphic novel class and how hard it is to pick 1970s comics to teach that will um, that a non fan will be able to appreciate given that this is a period when people are trying really trying to do new things but have so many constraints on them that um for the most part you can't just pick them up and give them and say here this is really great like you can do with watchmen right just give them watchmen give them mouse um but give them you know a run of steve gerber's defenders and you you end up having to do this kind of curating that you'd have to do with you know a medieval manuscript um because um what you have to do is explain yes this stuff isn't so great and this stuff is weird and this stuff yeah that you we wouldn't do this now but if you if you look at the rest of it and then think of how hard they were trying to get something good made um despite all the stuff they had to do then you have this really amazing um work of art i love that i love that as um this work is being kind of a provocation for sociality, you know, like a beginning of a conversation for companionable, like thinking with, with someone, you know, um, th that's, that's. Yeah. There's almost no way for, if you're not, if you didn't grow up with it, there's almost no other way to do it um, because it's, yeah, someone else has to infect you with the enthusiasm. <laughs> um, your first chapter reflects on what immediately came before this wave of 1970s comics. What was distinctive about Stan Lee's approach to representing subjectivity? Well, this was a real challenge for me when I was working on this introduction because I grew up really disliking Stan Lee's work. I didn't, I found the Marvel comics of the 60s, you know, not that readable and enjoyable because of the way he wrote. I really, really just could not stand it. Um, and yet I really loved, you know, the Galactus trilogy and so on and so forth. And so I would go through this thing where I'm, enjoying and not enjoying at the same time but i would knew so many people really really appreciated it and so what i was able to get myself to do again partly through teaching um and having to bring this to the students was to realize to the obvious which is okay what did lee and his collaborators bring to the comic that wasn't there before and it is the obvious stuff right these superheroes with real problems the bickering um the sense that they actually have um, flaws in real lives um, this was really quite novel. So um, it's not the prose. The prose, to my mind, is god-awful. Um, but the um, the interactions between the characters and the attempts to get into their head. Now, the way he got to their head was um, very uh, straightforward. Um, Stan Lee did not trust his readers very well. That's, you, they, you have all of these perfectly great panels done by Kirby where it's really obvious what's going on. And then you have to have uh, Reed Richards, someone explaining, look what's happening right here. And this is happening here. There's just, just no trust. But um, what you end up with is people proclaiming their feelings. And so you have soliloquies or, or almost like operatic arias um, where uh, someone's feelings are exposed at great length. And um, it's not subtle, but it's, it's a way of moving characterization from kind of one dimension to two. Um, and it really made these characters just so much more compelling than... Um, than at their rivals at National DC, where they barely had one dimension, they were pretty much interchangeable. Um, so this, so that I think is is um, his great contribution. I think at one point you um, you identify Spider Man as kind of a, a comic books Hamlet, right? Uh, a, a character overwhelmed with these doubts and these. Right, he's like Hamlet because he goes on and on and on. He doubts himself. He whines. He's neurotic. Um, absolutely, um, it's not a question of comparing quality. His soliloquies compared to, to Shakespeare's are just not, you know, not up to snuff. Or should they be? Um, but it's all about um, the agonizing choices that he is constantly having to make. And I would imagine that this was very relatable and interesting to readers um, at this time to to be constantly exposed to and living along with this um this con this constant uh, self interrogation and self doubt the second chapter is about a, a true rogue a conscientious objector to vietnam a writer who um i i found this out from your book uh apparently dropped acid and walked around manhattan to come up with ideas for the next doctor strange comic steve inglehart um, this is one of my favorite quotes from your analysis of Inglehart's Strange quote. This in Inglehart's hands is Stephen Strange's greatest gift. 
his capacity to confront the ineffable and return to the human world changed and yet the same, end quote. Talk to us about Inglehart's approach to Dr. Strange. Oh, sure. So Dr. Strange, um, through I think through no intention of Steve Ditko, who was really the driving force behind it, the artist, um, Dr. Strange was so trippy and psychedelic that he had a huge fan among the, the hippies that, that Ditko had no patience with because he was a nine Randian objectivist um, uh, as, as far right as you could get. But his visuals were absolutely amazing and it really fit in with this culture of, um, of mind expansion. So of course, um, when you have a changing of the guard and you have the next generation of comic book writers who one, grew up reading Marvel, two, were part of the counterculture, um, Doctor Strange um, is a really compelling character to use. So um, Englehart, I, I might be mixing up with someone else, but I think Englehart said at one point that he used to write Doctor Strange and the Defenders, a team book, and he just used them as someone who blasted energy from his, his hands and didn't really think about it. But then when he got the Doctor Strange book, he had to think, well, what, what does this really mean to, to be the a master of the mystic arts and eventually the source of supreme um what you know uh and he started to really uh, read about um mysticism and the supernatural and, and i think it actually changed his life because it's something he became quite preoccupied with in a lot of his later work um and so he followed up on a sort of a combination of ditko's um, trippiness and um you know castaneda 60s trippiness um to use it as a way of exploring the nature of reality but also what it means to be more or less an ordinary human encountering the numinous and encountering the numinous again and again and again because um he inherited this set of abstract concepts like this e eternity this giant body that represents the entire all of reality um and so on and so forth he inherited all of these things and um he would have Dr. Strange go on these amazing mystical explorations. And this is where um, I think what, what's brilliant here is how he adapts the um, sort of philosophical mystical quest narrative, which usually just brings you brings you to a place and leaves you there. Um, and the reality of serial comics, which is you have to keep telling the next story and telling the next story. So um, he manages to constantly have Dr. Strange go through this amazing experience and then just then go have to live his life. Um, it's kind of deconstructionist, really. Like, you know, you have this one level of meaning. Um, you've, you've completely, it, it's, it's sort of like if you if you're in the matrix and you recognize, yes, this is all a simulation and I know it's all a simulation, I'm going to wear it's simulation and I'm going to live in it. Um, and then occasionally not live in it. Um, that's kind of what I think Dr. Strange is doing, going back and forth between um, our mundane world, experiencing something incredible and then integrating in himself so that he can still live in our world too. And um, I don't know if this is something intentional on Engelhardt's part, but I think it worked really, really well. That, that's great. I, um, Engelhardt, Engelhardt also revitalized Captain America's fortunes. Um, I think, um, you know, as, as a comics reader myself in the 90s, Captain America comics were not of interest to anyone. You know, no one read it for, in in the '60s. It it seemed like Stanley was uh, as disinterested in Captain America as a character as as a writer could be, but Englehart really really changes um, Captain America's trajectory. Um, how did Englehart bring Steve Rogers into the 1970s? In some ways, preparing for his eventual centerpiece role uh, in the media empire, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, he did and he didn't, right? Because, of course, he did this great stuff in the 1970s, but you yourself mentioned the 1990s. Who wanted to read Captain America? It's all kind of cyclical. But what he... It's its really amazing to have this, you know, lefty conscience objector um, and giving him um, Captain America because I think someone like him uh, couldn't just say, okay, this is another guy in a costume, right? And just treat it as neutral, which is, I think, how a lot of people tried to treat Captain America when he was brought back in the 60s. Um, and so... Englehart is basically saying, this is a guy who is wearing the flag, right? Um, and this is a guy from World War II, and he's wearing the flag in like late 60s, early 70s. What does that mean? Um, and to some extent, you know, the, the, the ship had sailed in terms of treating Captain America as, as a victim of total culture shock because he'd been around too long. Um, the movies were able to do that like, much more effectively because you could brought them to right now. Um, but what Engelhart did was decide, well, okay, Captain America is a symbol, and um, it doesn't have to be a sim it, it doesn't have to be a symbol of jingoism. And, can, and what I think he does do that really does carry into the movie and carry into the best, most tolerable uh, interpretations of Captain America is that Captain America is not 
a symbol of um, flag waving and so on and so forth. Captain America is, is an aspirational symbol of whatever you think um, the best version of America is supposed to be. So Captain America is something to live up to. Um, and the problem for him in the 70s was the problem that America faced in the 70s, which is live up to what, right? Um, because the 70s was a decade that was you know, later characterized as, have, as Malay, as a decade of malaise by Jimmy Carter. Um, you have Watergate and the fallout of it and from it and the um, kind of cynical hangover from the 60s and the, and, and, um, and the counterculture. So um, you, it's not a moment for um, feeling really, really great about America. And he incorporated that really well with his Secret Empire storyline about a group of um, people wearing masks who are trying to take over the government by um, through this very complicated plot. Um, and it was about Watergate, but he kept swore up and down, it's not about Watergate. And the main villain was Nixon um, wearing a mask. Even, even I, at age nine, reading that, I figured, oh, that's Nixon. Um, even though they never showed him. Um, so th this completely disillusions Captain America and he stops being Captain America. Now this is a big cliche of superhero comics um, from the past several decades that uh, the, hero, the hero stops being the hero and passes the mantle on to someone else. Um, it's happened with Captain America several times, right? But this is the first time I'm aware of. Um, and um, also the reason that he stopped being Captain America was he just stopped believing in America. Um, and that was amazing. And so then Engelhardt had to have a storyline where, um, which would bring Steve Rogers back to the point where he could tolerate being Captain America um, and see a way to do it. That was really, really incredible. So um, I, again, I think the, the notion of the ideal is um, one of the things that Engelhardt contributed that made Captain America possible for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The third chapter of Marvel in the 1970s takes up uh, Doug Munch, did, who did interesting things with the comic Werewolf by Night, um, which, as you point out in your chapter, is superfluous uh, by two words. You know, all werewolves are are by night. Um, and also co-created the character of Moon Knight, right? Um, and one of his innovations was um, using caption text box boxes in a way that kind of anticipated the way they would be used by um, writers like Alan Moore in Watchmen. Can you talk a little bit about his, uh, Munch's um, innovations in terms of reflecting subjectivity in the self? Sure, he's a fascinating character for, for Marvel because um, he did his best work on the titles no one wanted, like Werewolf by Night, for instance, um, or Master of Kung Fu, Shang-Chi. Um, he was really, really good on the margins. Then when he's given a mainstream superior book, was okay, it wasn't bad, but it was never the thing that you really cared about. Um, and so when it comes to the captions, the interesting thing is he didn't invent the, the use of the captions for any of these comics. They all had first person narrative captions before he, um, before he got on them, but his use of them was just so very, very good. Um, in part because, you know, first person captions like, like voiceover and film and TV, they're, they're really challenging, right? Because um, they could just be superfluous, like Reed Richards telling you what it is that you're seeing on the page, right? So if you're, if you're actually getting the action and you can understand the story already without the first person captions, then what are the first person captions for? And what the first person captions end up being for in most of the stuff where Mensch used it, and again, where he didn't originate it, was um, having this parallel track going to the action where you have a sense of what it felt like or what was going on in the head of the character who's, who is... Um, doing these things. And in the case of the werewolf, um, it's the consciousness of Jack Russell, the um, human who's the werewolf, but who isn't really in control when these actions happening. So you have this fascinating split there. In the case of Shang-Chi, it's um, this wonderful opposition between the violence that he's engaged in um, as part of, you know, the genre and part of you know, what he knows how to do. And um, the philosophical introspection that's going on as he's doing it. Um, so you get this wonderful dualism between thought and action um, in a lot of what what um, Mensch is doing. By the time you get to Watchmen, um, it's taking it to another step, a step that was also done previously by this, by, um, in a comic called Whisper by Stephen Grant and his collaborators, where you have a narration going in the caption, and it's not at all about what you're looking at. It's completely different, but running in parallel, and you have to figure out what's going on in these parallel tracks. Um, that would have been much harder to get away with um, in the 1970s. I mentioned a little bit of that in Deathlock. 
Um, so yeah, there is a there is a development of the caption thing that's going on from the seventies through the eighties. Marv Wolfman is probably best known for his DC for his DC work in the nineteen eighties, New Teen Titans, and uh, the the Crisis series. But you bring attention to Wolfman's uh, Tomb of Dracula from the nineteen seventies. An interesting horror comic that returns to the Bram Stoker source and really attends to Dracula as a force for complicating the selfhood of his victims. Um, what were some representative sections of the distinctive Wolfman approach in the Tomb of Dracula comic? Yeah, the Tomb of Dracula comic by Wolfman is such an interesting and weird phenomenon because, um, yes. Wolfman did great superhero stuff in the 80s in DC, but he did lots of superhero stuff, superhero stuff in Marvel in the 70s, and none of it was all that interesting. And yet he was the guy who brought a Marvel superhero sensibility to DC in the 1980s. So um, the only thing that of his that I read in the 1970s that I thought was really outstanding was Tomb of Dracula, which he did not originate. Um, he was like the fifth writer on it by issue seven, um, but he really made it something amazing and part of it was um his deliberate return to stoker and um and stoker's devices when you read the, the actual dracula novel it's a fascinating compendium of different media used to tell a story including you know someone a doctor recording his notes on a on um wax like wax wax cylinder phonograph things and and mina mina murray learning shorthand um so you have lots so you have this kaleidoscopic approach to narrative which you have here with dracula um, and I, I think one of the things that Wolfman was facing was um, before Dracula, there just were not that many comics where the main where the protagonist was someone terrible, right? The protagonist is a villain. Dracula is a villain. He's supposed to be a villain. He's supposed to be horrible. He's killing people. Um, but we sympathize with the protagonist just because of the protagonist. This is something that you know you see in the age of the antihero on premium television, from Sopranos on, Breaking Bad, right? And Breaking Bad, everybody liked. Walter White and hated his wife, who was actually a totally decent person because she wasn't on board for committing all of these crimes. So there's there's this weird seduction um, of following the uh, the main character, even the main character is evil. So what what Wolfman does is he will sometimes have us follow Dracula and get to his head, but more often he'll have us follow other people. So he, Dracula gets refracted through their through their points of view, and then we see them die or see them suffer Dracula's hands and remind, oh yes, Dracula's really kind of horrible, but then we go back and reread his journals and we kind of like him again. And so one issue that I thought really handled this very well was an issue where um, there's a woman who it, her best friends are Tom Sawyer and Injun Joe and D'Artagnan from Three from Three Musketeers and a few others, but she's always wanted to be friends with Dracula, and she somehow magically brings Dracula to her place. She her psychic powers create these characters from fiction, but he's not fiction; he's real, right? And the problem is that she's in love with Dracula because she's read this book, it's sort of like people, you know, Twilight fans, right? But he's this horrible person, and she has to realize, no, he's he's absolutely. Um, terrible and, and burns the book she's actually uh, having a fan this sort of psychotic break in, in, in a mental hospital but you don't know that till the end um but that whole th the drama of it is really about being seduced by the vampire character that's what character these vampires do and then being confronted with how horrible he is and having to also reject him um and this is a something that the, the comic does again and again and again brings us close um and then then pushes us away um and that that is um very much a kind of um 21st century anti-hero move that I, that I find really really compelling you should also um talk a little bit about the the art that's that's complementing these writers because gene colon um who, who you discuss in that chapter um is really doing excellent work on tomb of dracula and i think um Early Bill Sinkowitz is doing work on Munch's um, Moon Knight around the same time. Yeah, yeah. Later in the eighties, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and as, so maybe we we can talk a little bit about um, the, the collaboration between um, Wolfman and his his artist uh, collaborators. Oh yeah, I mean, I think one of the criticisms that would be very easy to make of, of the book, and I try to head this off, but it's still there, is that this book is so writer focused. Um, and my explanation is that I think that the successes in the 1970s were primary writer focused. And you, there's a kind of, there's trends, right? That there are times when the writers seem ascendant and then the, the artists seem ascendant, ascendant in the 90s, the artists were ascendant. Um, but then you also had vertigo with the writers. And um, at Marvel now, the writers seem to be ascendant. Or at DC, the editors are ascendant. Um, and ideally, of course, you have a good working relationship. But the thing is that in a lot of these cases, 
the writers and artists didn't choose each other and they were um uh and writers would work with a whole different range of artists but the ones i'm talking about for the most part got really lucky with their collaborators um and mensch in particular on on um shang chi master kung fu had amazing artists now wolfman and also gerber on howard the duck had um gene colon gene colon was on pretty much every issue of um of Tomb of Dracula. Gene Cohen is an amazing, was an amazing draftsman who um, was a hit superhero artist in the 60s, but um, his approach, his layouts, his, his approach to um, action was a sort of, was a sort of thing that was, started to go out of fashion for superhero comics in the 70s, and certainly by the 80s. By the 80s, layouts tended to be very modular, kind of like newspapers were too, like grids, you know, square, square, square. Um, and it was that like that for a long time. It's only the past 15, 20 years that you have people like J.H. Williams and so on and so forth who completely disrupted that. And you have weird parabolas and circles and so on and so forth. But Colin was never a grid artist. Colin had all these incredibly weird layouts and um, and motion lines and um, and paid weird, wonderful attention to the way fabric moved. Um, all of the stuff that actually wasn't so action oriented, but worked really, really well for mood. Um, and so... Um, he was really well suited for a comic like um, Tomb of Dracula, which um, had so much, which wasn't about spandex. No one was wearing a form fitting costume. So his ability to do all these funky um, overcoats was great. Um, there's lots of shadows. There's lots of room for um, actually exploring what the characters looked like for making them distinctive. He was very, very good at that. So um, it was a great vehicle for character, which meant it was a great vehicle for Gene Colan. Um, so, at, at, but at the same time, when he was doing superhero comics in the 70s um it wasn't necessarily a great match well this might also be a good moment um to to ask you about the um material circumstances of collaboration because you know a lot has been written about like the marvel method of the 60s where stanley would give um kirby or ramita or ditko a um, kind of a sketch or maybe a couple of sentences about what the issue would be, then they would lay it out, then he would come back and, and write the dialogue in, as you said, in a kind of verbose, maybe overwritten, a purpley way. Um, how, do, how do these writers in the 70s um, go about collaborating with artists? Are they writing full scripts? Right. So the Marvel method was really a labor saving device for Lee, who was scripting all these comics. But it's also what has led to so much controversy over who the real creators were. Because on things like Fantastic Four, it seems very clear that most of the work was done by Kirby. Um, but the evidence, you know, where's the evidence, right? And and, and Lee was never shy about taking credits. Um, but the Marvel method had some real pluses in that it, it allowed for kind of spontaneity and collaboration. You know, the, the writer would come up with sort of a general idea of what should be on the page, for instance, get the eyes like, wow, okay, I'm gonna have them say this, or I'm gonna have them do that. Um, something you wouldn't have from full script. To my knowledge, um, I think all of these writers at Marvel in the 70s were doing Marvel Method. But doing Marvel Method meant different things for different people. For Lee, it meant basically saying, here's a couple of things, go off and do something and I'll, I'll <laughs> and report back to me. Um, for um, for some of them, like Mensch with some of his collaborators on Master Kung Fu, it was a matter of a lot of talking in advance um, before you even like on the phone or in person saying, we're going to do this. So that by the time um, by the time anything was written down and by the time the artist was drawing stuff, there was a sense that the two of them um, had a common understanding of what would be done. Um, but for the most part, it really was, you know, the writer looks at the page and says, okay, where am I going to put the words here? How, um, how many words, how much room do I have for words? What am I going to do with them? Um, and and you would go from there. Gerber didn't do full script, but he was very concerned with his dialogue. But you could see where he was just riffing off of what was um, on the page, too. So um, when done really well, it's a kind of great moment for spontaneity. It sort of makes me think of how, you know, in, in our discipline, in, in literature, in the humanities, if you go to a conference, um, so people read their papers word for word, which sounds really deadly and often is. Um, and sometimes people read them well, and most times kind of boring. So, and then occasionally someone just kind of stands up there and riffs. And the thing is, if they do that really, really well, it's amazing. But if they do that badly, it's even worse than when someone's reading in a really boring fashion. Um, so there's real um, 
payoff and um, danger in that kind of free form riff thing that I think um, the Marvel method allows. Nowadays, almost no one uses the Marvel method. The method it's a really it's a rarity, and people sort of announce it. Hey, we're doing Marvel method because it's almost all full script. And and I guess part of this would be facilitated by the by the fact most of these writers are are living in New York or living in the most region. Are living in New York. Many of them are editing their own comics. Um, there was a system called, uh, where you could be a writer editor that Jim Shooter, when he came along and um, as editor in chief, got rid of that. Um, the good thing being writer editor was, you know, no one's looking over your shoulder, you could do what you want. The bad thing is, no one's looking over your shoulder, you could do what you want. And these books were late. Um, they were, it was totally disorganized, but it allowed some like Gerber in particular to have this leeway that that he wouldn't have. And um, and I think that worked pretty well with the uh, uh, Marvel methods um, system because. It was so much less systematic, right? Um, in a much more organized editorial process. Okay, here's the pages. Here's the, here's the, here's the pencils. Here's the script. Here's the inks. We do this. And we, you know, it's an assembly line in the best and worst possible ways. But when you're your own writer editor, it's kind of you know whatever happens. I think. Well, I, I guess that's a good trans transition to um, late producers as well as as that freedom because Steve Gerber was notorious for for lateness, right, in the production of his comics. Yes. Yeah. Um, you describe Gerber as being something of a an existentialist and absurdist, um, and bringing that uh, orientation to superhero comics or or comics in general. You should say, um, how did Gerber approach the interior life of Omega the Unknown? So Omega the Unknown was a was a character that he created with his partner Mary Screenus. Um, and so the, it, they both were working on this, but Screenus was, all, was often an uncredited collaborator for Gerber, not not because he didn't want to give her credit, but because there's a whole complicated thing at, at Marvel. Um, but so what they did with with um, Omega was they kind of split the focus into two characters. This um, guy who's kind of got Superman colors and is a, from some other world. We don't know what he's about and who almost never speaks. Um, and then this 12 year old boy, James Mark Michael Starling, who is um, incredibly intelligent, like a genius, um, uh, hyper verbal, not in the sense of talking all the time, but just really, really articulate. And so you would get the artic you get the articulation from from um, James Michael, the silence from um, Omega. And then um, in the absence of Omega talking or even having a direct uh, line to his thoughts, you would have captions. Um, you'd have what um, were sometimes referred to as the uh, Omega, uh, Omega monologues. Like Jonathan Lethem called them that. Um, Jose Alanis calls them that. Um, where it's not exactly what Omega's thinking, but it's sort of almost like a sort of poetic riff based on what we might think that he is thinking. Um, and these were really playful and imaginative and fascinating. Um, and I felt made for good reading. They didn't really help you figure out what is actually going on in this comic. Um, but they... Um, and it wasn't clear even whose head you were in, but you were in someone's head because what Gerber was a, was a master at was voice, was voice and point of view. And it, there might not be someone to associate with that point of view, but the point of view is there. Um, and that's something that he did really well um, in Omega and in, um, and in Howard the Duck. And also Man Thing, where the main character has no mind and no personality. So, you know, you have to have, someone has to be doing the talking and thinking. It's not clear who it is. Well, well uh, yes. Yeah. Speaking of of a character who can fill in the silence, um, uh, H Howard the Duck, who ran for president in 1976, I guess as something I learned from your book, and um, got a reference, got a pretty flattering, I guess, um, call out in the literary fiction uh, uh, theorist critic John Gardner's book, Art of Fiction, right? Um, Howard the Duck. So, um, how did Gerber uh, approach? Howard the Duck, um, what does uh, Howard the Duck issue from the 70s uh, uh, sound like, look like? So Howard the Duck was literally a throwaway character that as he was there to provide a sense of absurdity in this man thing sequence. And then the editor said, get rid of the duck. So um, Gerber threw him off this interdimensional pathway and presumably to his death. And um, fans were so outraged um, and they wanted more of the duck. I, as a kid, I didn't get it at all at first. Um, but so he was brought back first as a backup feature in the comic that I kid you not was called Giant Size Man Thing um, for two issues and then he got his own comic and so what would happen in a Howard the Duck comic is yes there would be a fair amount of parody and there'd be genre parody and superhero parody and that's where people who would come after Gerber and try to do the duck for years until quite recently 
would just keep making the same mistake. They would think, okay, this is a superhero parody com um, comic. And, but that was never the most important thing about it. The most important thing about it was Howard's point of view, um, Howard's mood, Howard's interactions with, with his friend Beverly, um, and this um, running commentary on the absurdity of life that these ridiculous plots served as a springboard for. Um, but the action itself was almost, was close to inaction. You know, it was not, that's, I don't, certainly not what I read Howard for to figure, wow, what's going to happen next? How is he going to beat this bad guy? No, it's how is he not going to bother to even engage with this ridiculous villain because it's all so stupid. Now, this sounds kind of jaded, right? But the, the great thing about Gerber is he is, he's someone who comes in with this love of the Marvel universe and also awareness of how ridiculous it is um, and wanting to bring them both together, right? To, 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 to sit in that world and recognize its ridiculousness and stay there because there's something kind of wonderful about it too. Um, and that, um, that you, you can draw a line from that through things like Deadpool and um, Harley Quinn. And I'd say, you know, the, the Guardians of the Galaxy's movies. I mean, Steve Gerber did write some Guardians of the Galaxy, had no influence on these movies, but this kind of um, uh, self-aware irony, um, which obviously Gerber did an event. I think you can, you can see a, a line going through there. From, from Gerber's work to, to that part of the MCU. Can you read from your chapter on Gerber? Sure. Gerber, I have to say, Gerber is, Gerber is so unequivocally my hero here. Gerber, basically, um, I always would say, I can't say this anymore because these, these examples don't work too well, but I feel like I was formed as a, as a sense of self by a combination of Monty Python, Woody Allen, and Steve Gerber. Um, and now Woody Allen, right? But that this is the stuff that I grew up on that really, really helped me uh, develop a sensibility that I really responded to. Gerber just immediately um, grabbed me. So this is from page 233 of the book, in case anyone is looking. A certain point of view was always central to most of Gerber's Marvel comics. In Howard the Duck, that point of view, that voice, and that consciousness were all united in the figure of the protagonist. In this way, Howard the Duck functioned as a testing ground for Gerberian subjectivity, with every obstacle serving as an assault on this authorial sensibility. Howard's sarcasm, anger, pessimism, and literal misanthropy do not sound like they would make a winning formula, yet the comic had a serious cult following. His grumpy alienation made him the heir of the moribund underground comics movement whose antisocial protagonists rarely tried to win friends and influence people. Howard also had a bit in common with fellow Cleveland curmudgeon Harvey Picar, whose autobiographical comic American Splendor from 1976-2008 would finally gain broader attention years after Gerber's comics folded. And as for his heirs, the protagonists of the alternative comics of the 1990s, from Daniel Close's Enid and Ghost World and the eponymous star of David Boring, to the perpetually furious Buddy Bradley of Peter Bagg's Neat Stuff, all share Howard's jaded hostility to varying degrees. Where Howard differs, particularly from Buddy Bradley, is in the delicate combination of his acerbic wit and his inherent kindness. In the very last issue of Gerber's original run on Howard the Duck, number 27, Circus Maximus, Gerber has Howard declare... I'm not negative, I'm angry. But really, he is both. More to the point, Howard's constant carping and sniping are connected to the characteristic that makes him the embodiment of the true satiric impulse. Howard is disappointed. He lives in a perpetual state of dissatisfaction of the world, not just that he never made, but that continually fails to meet his basic standards of logic and decency. That's, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, can you talk to us about how a passage like this comes together? Um, what, what are the um, kind of writing um, ideals that you aspire for in your writing? Um, do you um, start with uh, a really polished draft and then work through revisions? Do you have a oh. reading group? Or? Oh, no reading group, no. <laughs> um, I, I'm very antisocial about my writing, except for the, the blog part. So my writing habits really changed once I started the blog for the Jordan Center on um the University of Russia at um, NYU, where I had to write short things a couple of times a week. And that became the way I approached everything. And I, this book originally was a blog. I serialized this entire book on a blog. Um, so I guess I wouldn't say a polished draft, but I just sort of keep working on the sentences until they feel right, and then I go on. Um, I I feel like I've, I've accomplished a lot in the past several years by really drastically lowering my standards and just moving on. Um, so it's just sort of what comes out, if it reads okay, and then I just move on to the next thing. 
Wow. Well, that's surprising because I find it uh, like very readable, um, really wonderful. And um, I found that there is a riffing in the book that I find really generative. You um, compare some of this comics work to uh, Andre Platinov's um, fiction at one point um, to Dostoevsky's uh, The Underground Man in really, I think, successful, uh, really effective ways. Um, so I, I do see some of that riffing in, in the writing. Oh, definitely. Thank you. I mean, I think that is exactly what I do. And I think that the danger and that sometimes comes up in the editing process is that I'm just digressing right and left. Um, I just sort of follow the stuff where almost by free association. And so then what I'll have to do is make sure it doesn't look like free association because it kind of is, you know, I will stop writing for the day and then pick up like, oh, okay, you know, some sense of, now I'll go off on something different, you know, that, that wasn't quite what I planned. And then, you know, in rewriting and then in response to, you know, um, editorial comments, I was like, oh yeah, this doesn't really, this doesn't really flow. This is just sort of, um, you have to kind of sit in my head to see why this um, fits together. And, and I have to make sure that this can be followed by someone who isn't sitting in my head because um, that's not really very practical. Um, oh, maybe we can go back to um, Don McGregor's work. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. um, who uh, you, you rightly point out in the chapter um, approached a uh, black protagonist in a very distinctive way. Um, uh -huh. he, he sort of has a, a liberal sensibility, um, a, a sort of good intention sensibility, but there are um, some problems with his representation. In particular, that chapter deals with um, how the, the body and pain um, uh -huh. can express pain. Uh, I think you quote Elaine um, Scary, who talks about the unshareability of of the pain experience. Can you talk a little bit about uh, McGregor's work on uh, Luke Cage or Black Panther? Or, or yeah, anything? it's. I, I was really torn to think of how much to racialize it because um, I don't want to take away at all from the amazing accomplishment that um, McGregor has, particularly with Black Panther, even though Kill Raven is my favorite thing that he did, um, because he was really the first person to develop Wakanda in a um, in a compelling way and give it a culture and make it not a book with one black guy surrounded by white people. Um, he really took the notion of this African um, country um, and um, all black cast quite seriously in a way that um, no one else at Marvel was interested in. So it's very easy decades later to say, oh, white liberal, you made this mistake and that mistake. Of course he did. Um, but, but setting aside you know the, the little things that could make you cringe now because there's always going to be something um what he did was was truly astounding um that he was able to um to develop the, this this uh this world and these characters um and not make them just even though there's so much pain going on just sort of um suffering objects like in the 1970s thanks to things like roots um on television the miniseries roots based on the book um there's you know the in addition to portraying black people as criminals and pushers and so on and so forth it's um there's almost this kind of weird entertainment for white people watching black people suffer as slaves and all that right so um that's not what he's doing here um but um and in kill raven too he mcgregor just is really fascinated by um the the, the problem of representing representing pain because pain is of course something that becomes kind of inexpressible and um he so he tortures his characters i mean he has people torture his characters which i think is a legitimate thing in an adventure genre um and he does this to kill raven who is a white character um but it's still the valence of it still feels different when a white writer is doing this to these, to these black characters um especially with things like having a black panther um you know on a cross by the ku klux klan um so um so when it is a black body up there um it does become as we like to say nowadays problematic um but i think it's obviously with the best of intentions and it's a there's it's there's a racial component to the question but it's also part of this larger thing that really fascinates um mcgregor which is um giving voice to the body um uh, in particular to the body and suffering um and doing so in a way that is so verbal right because he just um has so many words right it's trying so hard to be poetic and and often it really works and sometimes it doesn't um but it's it's a fascinating enterprise um so in many ways he's a poet he's a poet of pain he's a poet of physical pain um but it but when you're doing that to black character when a white guy's doing it to black characters it, it does end up feeling different yeah you um i believe that chapter opens um with a uh uh satirical what was it marv wolfman who um sort of mocks it was actually, mcgregor's I think it was Engelhardt. yeah oh, Engelhardt. yeah Engelhardt. Engelhardt has the black panther going on about oh the 
the misty, this whole flowery thing. Um, and it's funny, but it's actually, I also point out wrong, right? Because his captions are like that. But McGregor's dialogue is really, really sparkles and is clever and witty. And he's really great at banter. So it, it, there's less of that in the way people are talking to each other than there is in the way that the, the narrator is talking. And yeah, people's, people's mileage can really um, vary from that sort of thing. Um, but when it works, like in Kill Raven, he has these amazing poetic passages, beautiful, like the last issue of Kill Raven, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, issue 39 of, of Amazing Adventures, as, as everybody knows, right? Um, really, really beautiful. So um, it's, again, one of those things, when, when it works, it works so well. And when it doesn't work, it's, it, you know, it really, really doesn't work. But um, but the attempt is so is, is, is really so worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and also with, the, with the giving voice to the pain, the other thing is that um, one of his big themes is empathy, right? Of, of, of what it means for someone to feel along with someone else. And that's kind of what he's having us do as we're sort of suffering along with someone who's being tortured. And I, I think that um, Englehart's um, sort of satirical take on McGregor reminds us that all these writers are like in the same uh, environment. They're crossing each other's paths and uh, the hallways of Marvel, I guess, in, in, um, in Manhattan, right? In, in, yeah, I mean, Gerber's making fun of, Gerber made vicious fun of McGregor in two different issues of Howard the Duck, while they're also like hanging out and, and putting together the merch for the Howard the Duck uh, presidential campaign. So yeah, it's very, very much a kind of um, in-group thing. Um, I saw one of your syllabuses for a graphic novel course. I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, teaching. Uh, in it, you assign Jean Luen Yang's American Born Chinese and Gerber's Howard the Duck alongside texts like um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse or David Mazzuchelli's Aster Asterios Pala. Uh, how do you approach teaching the graphic novel and uh, what, what texts do students gravitate toward? Uh, let, let me put the question in a slightly more provocative way. Do students find it harder to um, rigorously analyze a, a mainstream Marvel comic from the 70s, or do they find it harder to discover enjoyment in the less mainstream kind of art comics? Oh, well, their large class is a bit of both, but um, some of the art co comics really just challenge them too much. Like I always insist on doing um, Jimmy Corrigan, Smartest Kid on Earth, and it it goes over like a lead balloon with most of them and I just still keep doing it because it's, but it's really like I'm trying to teach them, you know, Finnegan's Wake, you know, it's really that complicated. Um, so the structure of the course is that, it, you know, it starts out chronologically because it does make some sense. And then once I get to about the eighties, I ditch chronology and go thematically. And so the first half is very superhero heavy because of the chronology and the second half is more of a mix. So people who are getting sick of superheroes, like where was the stuff all this first half of the semester, right? Um, so what I try to do um, I want you know, I want to take superheroes seriously, and I I I want to not have this approach where you know the only good comics are not superhero comics, but I also don't want it to be completely dominated by superheroes. So there's a real balance here. I also I also you know so many of the good things are memoirs, and I really love these memoirs. But in general, as a genre, I, I hate memoirs. Um, so I'm kind of stuck with like doing all these memoirs, um, and then there's a question of affordability and so on and so forth. But what after teaching this course like over 15 years, for the most part, what I end up teaching, though I always throw in something new, the ones that keep coming back are the ones that I think just really teach really well, where the students, even if they don't like it, they respond and have something to say. Um, or where I know like they're gonna have no reaction initially, but we can do something. Like we do Will Eisner's The Spirit, and which is brilliant, visually brilliant, but I know that the first time I read it, I was like, I have nothing to say about this, right? You have, to, that's where someone has to say, look, look what's going on on this page. This is so great. And then they can see it. Um, but they're going to pick it up. It's like, why am I reading this? Why am I reading this? But, but, uh, but I go with that. that and we use it. Um, but something like Howard the Duck, roughly half of them like it and half of them don't like it. And then I feel that's okay. Um, and then after that, you know, everybody, most everybody loves Watchmen, most everybody loves Batman, Dark Knight Returns, you know, the things that are, are kind of hits. Um, and so I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to teach a canon, but I'm trying to select a bunch of, of works of comic art that um, are worth talking about and that people might want to read and reread. Um, I'm uh, Perhaps some of those students are kind of uh, going through the process I went through and, you know, when I was entering college, which was like figuring out a way to reconcile this comics love with this this sort of um, emphasis universities place on literature, on kind of prestige art. Um, and I'm curious about um, the shift in your own research. 
um, most of your books up to this point are on um, Russian literature, um, I, uh, canonical Russian literature, and that's your departmental home. How did you go about? Oh, go ahead. That's okay. It's my departmental home, but most of the stuff I do isn't canonical. It's contemporary. Um, so I've gone away from. I'm, I'm I'm the guy who reads the crap no one else wants to read. Um, and then I do internet culture stuff. But um, with the comics, you know, you would think that the students might be having the trouble you're talking about, like the, the high art versus the low art and all that. But for the most part, they're not. Um, because this is a general education course. Um, and it's taken by students who are not majoring or minoring in a humanity or an art, which is almost all of them nowadays. And so um, most of them, there's always a few, this is like a group of 150 people. There's always a few hardcore North American comics readers. But for the most part, if they read anything, they read manga. Um, and they are not invested in high culture at all um, and find the idea of writing papers really very daunting um, and don't read very well or very often. And at the beginning of the course, I, I try to, you know, the whole, whole thing, like this is a serious thing. Yes, we're reading comics, but it's serious. Um, and I'll say, you know, some of these things will take a long time to read. You don't want to wait for the night before to read Watchmen. You need to give yourself some time. But others you could read the night before, and I try to tell them that. But then when they actually don't do the reading, I find myself saying, for God's sake, you can't even read a comic book for this class, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a very different contingent from what it was 15 years ago. These are just, these are, they can be very, very good students. They do get engaged, um, but they don't tend to come with a great deal of um, commitment to to cultural production. Um, they're just that they, um, they start out rather passive, um, and then you have to get them to be kind of active. That's interesting. Um, you sort of mentioned a couple of texts that you you find consistently teach well. Um, which graphic novels or, or comics um, do you find yourself um, returning to teach to? Um, you know, they, they pop it no matter uh, what kind of group you're teaching. Sure, well, Watchmen, I've taught Watchmen in other classes too, in a utopia class, in a science fiction class, Watchmen works everywhere. And Watchmen, Watchmen and also a serious polyp, they're, they're rewarding in the sense that they make you work, but they also... <laughs> pretty quickly give you dividends once you start working. Like you can congratulate yourself. Oh, look what I saw here, right? So, um, and that I think is really important because you actually can feel good about like, wow, oh, I worked and I see this, right? And then then in the lecture, I can get them to see more. And so you can get excited because it's a challenging work that is not too challenging. Um, uh, um, Jimmy Corrigan is too challenging. But this stuff, it's... It's challenging, but you can be brought up to it, and then you can feel like, wow, I really, really got something. So that always works. Batman Dark Knight Return always works. Um, Fun Home teaches really, really well. And of course, they love memoir, but it's a great book. Um, but then there are things like, for the past several years, I've been teaching the first volume of um, the Kamala Khan Ms. Marvel. Um, you know, the, the character, um, the New Jersey-born um, Pakistani-American Muslim uh, Ms. Marvel. and. I just find it challenging to teach, to teach because I read it. I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's one of the things like, I love it. It's great. And then what else are we going to say about it? Except that it's really great. And of course, the stuff with, with the representation. So that to me, there's a type of, of comic that is a challenge to me that's really, really well made and fun. And that's enough. Um, and then what I find when I read the criticisms is, okay, then there's like people doing the obvious thing, like, you know, and gender in Ms. Marvel and the um, and uh, the other and Islam in Ms. Marvel, all that is great. But to me, it's like, do I need to read? I kind of can figure out what they're going to say before I start reading it because it's an obvious concern. Um, so for me, it's always a matter of like, well, what what is the what is the unexpected take to find in all in, in that? And then Ms. Marvel, for instance, I haven't found it. I just really really love it, but I but I haven't found it. Um, so that's a comic where everybody enjoys it. And they might have things to say, but they're not necessarily like really analytical things to say, but they just get really, really excited. Yeah. It's not so bad. Yeah. I, and um, to, to go back to this book as a departure from your other work. Oh, um, yeah. I, and I, I found it something that enriched the book, the, the drawing on Platinov or Dostoevsky. Um, but, you know, it comes with certain challenges. You have to find, um, uh, perhaps new scholarly communities, different conferences, different uh, audiences for, for a new project. What were the challenges or opportunities of shifting your scholarly focus? Well, do it, like, writing the book was not so hard to do. Um, what was intimidating for me was 
realizing that, okay, there's this world of comic scholarship that I've been reading. I've been constantly reading it, but haven't had to engage with so seriously um, and trying to figure out how to engage with it. And then also feel like, on the one hand, an insider when it comes to comics, because I've been breathing this stuff all my entire life, but an outsider in terms of comic scholarship. And it's worried me that like I could, you know, it's, I could so imagine people who are comic scholars, like, oh, here's this guy, yeah, he's read comics all his life, so he thinks he can write about comics. And we've been writing about comics for so long. And that's, you know, that's fair. Um, so I see that. I have never gone to a comic studies conference. I've never presented it because I, I've never really written an article um on this stuff so i am completely separate from it my life as a comic book fan has always been very much alone i was an embarrassed closeted comics fan as a kid I, and i found other people who liked comics kind of embarrassing um so i you know i see the world online and i see how different it is for for younger people but for me this is really kind of this this solitary world that i know lots and lots of other people share so i'll be fascinated to see what kind of reception it gets from comic scholars because the other thing about comics, the comics world is um, there are a lot of really clever and not very nice people. There are a lot of really nice people. There, there's, there's lots of room for just being really biting and sarcastic and nasty. I'm not going to name the people. They're really, really good at it. I enjoy reading. It's like, oh God, if they write about me, I'm going to be totally screwed. Um, so I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll be interested to see um, if I'm, if it's welcome or not really. Well, well, that that um, comic book readers can be a tough, tough audience in general. Um, yes. Yeah, um, biting. So, um, yeah, it's definitely an adjective yeah. attached to a lot of comic book readers. Um, are there um, are there some comic book um, writers, critics um, that you would that you would recommend that you've been inspired by? So, I mean, besides the people in the book, obviously. I mean, the people the people I like now. What I realized is my my um, tastes in comics are really kind of perfectly middle brow, right? Like um, I was reading a book on Vertigo comics, DC's Vertigo comics, and I realized, you know, I am like the ideal Vertigo reader, you know, someone who likes sophisticated fiction but really likes superhero, super adjacent stuff, and um, and there's a kind of market niche that I see myself falling into. It's like, and I, and I don't necessarily seek out all the really, really experimental things. So all my recommendations are really obvious, like Jonathan Hickman, um, uh, who is an amazing writer and sometimes not so much lately, but a really interesting designer and artist who's writing much more um, lately. Brian Vaughn. I mean, my recommendations are what any sophisticated mainstream comics fan is going, is going to make. Um, there's nothing really, really shocking there. Um, I have to make myself work to read um, the more experimental stuff and, and enjoy it. And I'm making myself read more manga um, because it's really a foreign foreign territory for me. Um, but yeah, um, I, I like all the obvious people. <laughs> are, are you following Hickman's new thing, the Three Moons, Three Planets? Book? Yeah, I subscribe to it. But following is an interesting word because so it's a sub stack and he'll release a page or two at a time. And I just can't keep track. Like I'm, I'm pretty much a wait for the trade guy anyway. Anyway, so I see it looks really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what he's doing, and I'm just waiting for it to be a really um, satisfying chunk of narrative that I can consume, rather than these like little bits and pieces here that um, are clearly part of this grand scheme that he has with all those other people. But, um, but I just want to wait for the finished product. I'm a, are you I'm following? A no, no, I'm a wait for the trade person too. I mean, the the difficulty with that is um, he's sort of cutting out comic book stores and and other other forms. So you, I think you have to subscribe to the Substack to to get it. So yeah. Right. Well, there will be. I'm sure there'll be a digital. Form. I mean, I I stopped reading comics on paper years ago, so it's all digital for me. Um, but yeah, I, there's got there's definitely going to be some sort of digital distribution of like a full thing but i thought there would be more of that by now and there, there hasn't um so at some point i think when substack stops throwing so much money at these people um, they're gonna have to actually come up with products <laughs> that people can buy so now that this book is out in the world um what are you turning your attention to have you begun the next research project uh is there yeah i'm actually in the middle of several i i write several books at once which is really odd and bizarre and um yeah i don't yeah so i have um another book coming out at the end of the year about HBO's Leftovers. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably next year I'll have 
three more books about Russian topics, um, but I've also started writing two more books on um, comics. Um, one is, surprise, I never thought I'd do this, Marvel Comics in the 1980s. Um, I'm turning my attention to that. And the other is something I'm calling um, uh, reading the superhero, reading the superhero ethics, crises, and superboy punches. And what I'm trying to do is sort of ridiculously ambitious in that I, I want to come up with, I'm trying to link the question of intervention and in vigilantism in the superhero genre with the question of um, continuity revisionism in um, the sort of large event stuff to kind of come up with a, with a sense of like how these comics work. Um, so I, I have this, I've written this chapter on, on watcher figure, figures and editor figures, and now I'm writing, writing about the law. And if it works, I'm going to be very excited about it, but it's a very possible it'll just sort of clunk. But those are the two comics things I'm working on. And I like to say that if I go on to um, Marvel Comics in the 1990s, it'll just be a vomit emoji. Um, mm -hmm. But really, <laughs> I can actually imagine that there are some good things there. So depending <laughs> on how this works, if I end up with Marvel in the 1980s as something that I don't feel as hacky, and so far I'm, I'm hopeful, um, then, then, um, I can see continuing with Marvel because um, because basically it's this monoculture that I'm I'm stuck in um, for my entire <laughs> life. I I read whatever Marvel puts out, even if I hate it. So Just, I, I'm really interested in that project. Besides uh, Claremont, um, which which writers do you think you'll be um, engaging with in the eighties? So I'm finishing up my Claremont X-Men chapter right now, which just keeps going on and on, which is very appropriate because Claremont always. <laughs> I'll have a chapter on Frank Miller's Daredevil. Um, I might have just a combined writer artist chapter on um, Simonson's Thor and Burns' uh, Fantastic Four. Um, but I also want to have a chapter on the on the experiment with the various imprints they have in the eighties, and um, which will give me a chance to talk about a really I don't know somewhat underrated but hit or miss writer J M De Matisse. Um, who did a Moon Shadow, which was a wonderful comic from the 1980s and did this really good run on Defenders. Um, Bill Sienkiewicz's um, uh, Straight Toasters, which I'm really rereading and trying to understand for the hundredth time. Um, so yeah, because uh, the, the, the consistent thing that I want to do with these books, if I keep doing it, like especially if I were to get to the 90s, is I don't want to spend time writing about a bunch of comics and explaining why I think they're bad. Um, I think that's just fish in a barrel and not very, very interesting. So then it's more like, well, what's good here? You know, um, so my problem for the 80s, is I have no interest in writing on Venom. <laughs> I just don't care about Venom. I'll have to bring it up somewhere in this, oh, in this um, overall chapter. Um, but um, even the 80s, to think like how people do good work when it gets really corporatized and um, and centralized and um, soulless, where, where there's still space to do um, creative, interesting things. And there were a few people who did it. That's awesome. Um, we'll look forward to those projects. I got to finish the leftovers. Um, I, I haven't started season three, um, but oh, I you like the first two seasons. Yeah, 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 and loved it. It's great. It's terrific. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm obsessed. I wrote the book basically because I'm just obsessed with the show, and I, I taught it in my Unquiet Dead class. And my students got really into it, so I just yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to that book. Um, thank you for um coming on the pod, Elliot. Oh, thank you for spending the time. I really appreciate it.